Sebastian, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I'm delighted that you're here to chat about Solution. I discovered Solution after hearing about your raise and I started looking into the product and I'm very interested in what you're doing. So I'm delighted to have you on today. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you so, thank you so much, Nick. I'm very happy to be on the podcast. Um, it, it, it's 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 something that I've been looking forward to since I started the company to really tell the story from the beginning. Um, so I'm very happy to get the opportunity to do that right now. Um, as as you mentioned, uh, the industry is it's it's one of the oldest industries that we know. Uh, it dates back from uh, going back to the Vikings, exploring uh, other continents and everything, uh, and it kind of stayed in the same way that it always has been uh, very old relying on very old technologies um, but that's also something that passionated me to go into the sector um, so uh, maybe i can dive into uh how i started in the sector because um, I, it I, i'd love to get there but i'm gonna cut you off because one thing i want to do right because there's so much to talk about solution and i can't wait to hear how you got into that but I always love to start with founders to learn a little bit more about what they did before their current thing. And I'd love to know about your story. You know, I've obviously done my own little bit of research, but I think the audience would really benefit from hearing about what you did before you came to Solution, if that's if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so I, I will start off at the beginning. So um, I, I'm from Belgium. I was born here in, uh, in Belgium. And uh, throughout my um, education and school career, I joined uh, on the age of six. I joined uh, um, Sea Scouts. I don't know it's 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 a thing in English, um, but it's it's like the the Boy Scouts. But we focus on going at on the water. Like in your first years, it's um, a lot of swimming, and then uh, when you get older, it's with rubber boat boats that you sail on the on the uh, small uh, rivers here in Ghent, and then you go to sailing, and then after that, you make very big trips uh, w- with these bigger sailing boats af- as, as you grow older. And I think as as a lot of people will recognize is the difficulty after high school. It, what I'm going to do next, what it, what will be my field of study. And um, it was the same with me that I didn't really know what to do. Uh, I really like math, um, but I also like being uh, at, at, at sea. Uh, so that pushed me to pursue the nautical studies. So I start studying in Antwerp uh, to become a, a maritime officer and uh, with the ultimate goal to becoming a pilot. Uh, a pilot is you can become a pilot after you uh, succeed your career in the, um, in at sea to become a captain. So you you start up as a third officer navigating the seas, and then a second officer, first officer, and then captain. And then once you become captain, uh, you can become a pilot. And a pilot is someone who specializes in a, a sector at sea. Uh, for example, the uh, the Wester Skelt here in Antwerp, uh, where you go on board different kind of vessels and actually assist the captain on board navigating those really special narrow rivers with sandbanks and everything. So I, a lot of my colleagues at school actually uh, mentioned that that was their goal because being at sea sometimes is hard to, um, to start a family, um, being away. Uh, for such a long time. Um, When I finished my studies, I joined um, Sea Trade, which is a container shipping company. We specialize in um, the refrigerated containers. So uh, these are fruits, vegetables, uh, meats, but also pharmaceutical uh, products like vaccines and everything. Uh, and uh, our main focus was bringing the Kiwis from New Zealand to Europe. And these were contracts from uh, six months. So I joined the vessel in September and then left the vessel in February. Um, so these were very long contracts, very difficult to maintain a social life uh, because you're cut off from, from, from the world uh, 
completely. You don't have any cell reception at sea. Sometimes when you are in a harbor, you have some cell reception and you use that time to call your family and friends. But after a couple of months, you, you, you really don't have the energy to, to, to do that because you don't really have stories and you don't really want to hear about the parties that people are doing here in Belgium. And just like, I, I will do my time. And then afterwards I, I will hear about the stories when I come back. So that's why people really envision becoming a pilot because then it's seven days and it's in the region that you live and it's much easier to, to start a social life. Um, and, and that was the same thing with me. So that was my goal. Um, but actually right after my, um, first contract, uh, my first long contract of six months, uh, in February, I left the vessel after six amazing months because. I, I really love the sea. Uh, I, I really want to make that clear. I am I'm, I'm passionate about the sea. I love being at the sea. I love the rest that that the sea gives you, because I, I mentioned the 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 discomforts, but there are also a lot of benefits. Like being cut off is is also really relaxing for your mind and your body. You can really enjoy your time off. Like um, I I can compare it to. To my life right now uh if if my if i if i close the door here at the office i go home and i get messages and emails and snapchat and instagram and at sea when i go down to my to my cabin there is really no no one that can disturb me um i can read a book i can i can work out i can watch the stars and in, in pure rest nobody will, will will yeah interrupt me with that so, so yeah, that, that's really something that I miss right now. Um, being, being alone sometimes with, with my thoughts. Um, but to, to come back to the story, uh, I left the vessel in February. I disembarked in Panama. Um, uh, I was home so somewhere at the end of February and two weeks later, uh, COVID happened. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that was something really big. The world changed and, um, a lot of my friends and colleagues actually weren't able to go home to see their families because even if their contact ended, there were no flights, they couldn't get home. Um, so that, that made me, uh, take the choice of being home, uh, not, not joining the vessel again, because I was really yeah, anxious to, to be stuck on a vessel. I had friends that, that were on the vessel for over a year. Um, and that six months is okay. Uh, but a year is really long. Uh, don't sing your family and everything. How did you, you transition from that difficult period to then saying, or to today where you're leading this, this startup in the IOT space? Yeah. So, so during that time at sea, actually, um, there were some things that I needed to do. Obviously I was a junior. So a lot of the, um, yeah, more boring tasks were laid upon me. Uh, ap besides navigating the ship, I, I did some, uh, extra hours. Uh, like for example, all these refrigerated containers have a, a specific temperature that they need to be set on. And if they go over this temperature, the, the cargo gets spoiled or, or, um, perished. And one of my tasks was checking on these containers with a, with a piece of paper where it was written down, this is the specific temperature that the container needs to be on. And then I needed to check that with the containers. And if something was wrong, I needed to contact the electrician, check the cargo, uh, maybe fix the container, uh, all those kind of things. And that took me about two to three hours every day to check on these containers. And it was just one time in 24 hours that I checked them. And I thought this manual labor would never exist uh, on land. Uh, and that made me think, how can, how can it be possible that in, in the 21st century, something like this is still happening at sea. Uh, and the uh, feedback that I always got from the more senior um, officers on board was, yeah, we live in a steel environment here at the vessel. Every wall that you see is thick steel walls to make the ship, um, more rugged and make sure that it doesn't sink. Uh, and the steel walls prevent any signal from going through, uh, as, as the cage of Faraday, um, describes. 
Uh, and and not only that, but also um, during one of my internships uh, before that contract, I actually did an internship as well below deck, so in the engine room, um, to, to get to know how, how everything works right there. And I saw that uh, some engineers needed to check uh, three times a day for the logbook, uh, all these manual counters um, to to visualize that on the old cars you had a, um, uh, a, kil a kilometer teller uh, counter that that ticks uh, when when you drive, and these kind of counters are also at at sea on the on the generators on the main engine, uh, and we we had a, a tiny piece of paper that we wrote down what was the, the, the counter saying, and now we wrote it over in the, in the logbook. And then the, the big logbook gets, gets stored somewhere and nobody looked over it again, uh, only, only to write some new information in it. But there was nothing being done with that data. And I was like, well, we can do so much with this data. Um, if, it, if it's in a computer or some kind of technology that, that analyze it. So that was, that was two things. And then something very unfortunate happened that uh, one of the interns on board of my vessel actually fell down the stairs uh, after his hours, uh, also checking on these reefer containers. Um, and um, you're only 16 people on a vessel of 200 meters, uh, but up to 400 meters. So it's a really big vessel and you're doing these jobs alone. Uh, he fell down, he broke his foot and um he, he wasn't able to to call anyone uh so he laid there for over three to four hours and it was only during breakfast that we noticed that someone was missing and we started looking for him maybe he was sleeping so we checked his room and then after a couple hours we found him and wasn't able to climb the ladder uh because of his foot and fortunately it wasn't that that um yeah that bad uh, it's just a broken foot, but mentally he was really suffering. You, you saw it in his eyes that he was, he, you don't know what time it is. You don't know how long you will lay there. Uh, maybe it can go for eight hours. Uh, it, it was really, uh, I saw it in his eyes that it, and, and I remember it till this day that, uh, that was something that triggered me to start thinking of a solution that how can he call for help and was. It was the same thing. There are steel walls, radio isn't working. Uh, so I start sketching up uh, some some solutions like a panning button. And uh, and then when I when I got back home and it was COVID, I had a lot of time to think because everyone was staying at home. Uh, you had nothing to do or you cannot uh, go out with friends. So I really start diving into the solution. I uh, start looking on the internet if there were already solutions. Uh, and the only thing that I could find was solutions that used mesh net, mesh technology. So these are like uh, Wi-Fi repeaters, as we know that at home. So they use a signal that they get, and then they push it forward to extend um, the reachability of the of the Wi-Fi or the signal. Uh, but the thing with this is that you you make a chain of nodes, and if one node in the middle, for example, fails, then you have a really yeah, large space that isn't connected anymore. Uh, so I knew that that wasn't the way forward because definitely if we wanted to pursue um, safety, uh, we needed uh, something that's really reliable. Uh, so I'll start looking into what cables were present on board of the vessel. And then I actually found a theory that uh, we could use um, the cables on board of the vessel to create some kind of network. Um, and when I figured that out, uh, it was already allowed to meet up with friends. So I reached out to an old uh, school friend of mine uh, who was an electrical engineer at the time. And I started telling him about my ID because obviously I'm no electrical engineer. I'm a maritime officer. And he looked, looked into that and he said, I think you're onto something. And um, then during that time, I was on a skiing trip with one of my best friends um, and I was making a pitch deck to find investors because obviously it's a hardware uh, solution. Uh, so I needed money to, uh, to file for a patent, to start developing everything. Um, 
And he was actually in um, investment banking at the time. And he saw me making this pitch deck and he was like, you, you cannot send this out. It's so unprofessional with all these animations and you cannot do this like that. And he said, okay, I, will, I, I won't go skiing today and I will help you. And uh, he got so intrigued by the solution that he um, quit his job in London uh, from investment banking and he joined uh, me as a co-founder together with uh, the electrical engineer. So we are actually three co-founders. So it's me, Romeo and Ruben, uh, who then founded the team. And we really quickly got into an accelerator here in Belgium. It's called KBC Started. Um, it's one of the biggest banks in Belgium. Um, and they really helped us in the first phase of our startup to go, yeah, to, to kick it off actually. With regard to the overall solution that you provide, um, you've got these sensors. You you said that you had to file patents, so so therefore this is something that you guys have, have made yourselves, I, I assume, or you've you've have you outsourced the creation of these sensors to somebody else for design and then you're patenting what they create or or how is that working? What do you what do you own? Yeah, so maybe I can show one slide just to visualize it. Please. So this is the vessel that, as you can see, uh, what we've created together with um, a company here from Belgium, it's actually a hardware producing company because obviously we are no hardware producers. Uh, so uh, it's actually that the, the blue line that you see is actually the existing cabling that we use. And then on these cables, we attach a small uh, gateway, as we call it, and that gateway picks up all the different kind of data from, for example, critical machinery, um, like I said, the, the reefer containers and also the crew safety. Um, so that's actually something that we made and also that we patented. And then on the, on the uh, bridge, there is our central module that filters these, this data that gets sent over the cable by our gateways back out and then analyze it and display it for the captain to be used and, and analyzed. And also it can be sent to the cloud for the ship owner to actually see what's happening on board of their vessel. And to make something clear is that um, we call ourselves a hardware enabled software company because once our gateways and our central module is installed on the vessel, it's really all, all about the software, how we analyze the data, how we uh, gather the data, how we make use cases around adding sensors on the vessel. Um, so one of the main things that we do at Solution is actually create partnerships with companies like, for example, Schneider Electric, one of the leading IoT companies in the world who have a really uh, large uh, collection of wireless sensors. Uh, but they weren't able to sell these to the maritime industry because of this connectivity issue. And with our technology, they are able to sell their sensors to the maritime companies as well to put their sensors on critical machinery, on temperature cargo. And now we have another partner that's creating wearables for the crew members. So if there is a case of man overboard situation or someone falls down the stairs or gets unwell, immediately an alarm will be triggered on the bridge saying in that room this crew member is in the need of immediate assistance uh, reducing that time from like i said three to four hours to to literally seconds or minutes that's incredible the the, the let's say all this information is being fed back to i and I don't know exactly the terms, but I assume that it's something to the effect of a bridge, right? There's a bridge that's a control room for all of this vessel. What, what, where does all this data feed into? So if I'm a user, if I'm a captain, if I'm, you know, steering this, this vessel, I'm in charge of the deck that day, what am I seeing to see all this, this activity through the sense? Yeah. So, so. Um, sorry for the terminology, but the bridge actually is the, the place where the captain sits. So it, it, right above the, the, I, I don't know if you see my mouse, but here on the, is, are the, these windows is actually where the, the captain or the officers are sitting, navigating the vessel. And there is actually a screen 
where all these data gets um, gets displayed in a very nice manner um, so so that they have an overview of everything that's happening and also it's it's linked to the alarm system for example for the crew safety that that an alarm will be triggered and so they, they will be notified immediately even though they are not looking at the screen actively that because, screen yeah. and that U UI is that provided by you guys as well is that something you guys have developed as well or is it plugging into an already existing system yeah, so you have you have obviously you have already screens at the bridge displaying uh, uh, some some of the critical machinery like RPMs and 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 some of te some temperatures, but that's that's really not enough. And and we actually integrate uh, with with that display already, uh, and we add really new sensors to get to to improve fuel efficiency, but also to uh, to improve predictive maintenance. So so. There's nothing blowing up in the engine room without you knowing it in uh, in advance, so you can anticipate that some some something is going wrong and then maybe prevent it from happening. Uh, there's yeah. there's so many things that Solution does. Do when you're prospecting to customers, um, how do you sort of package the solution which you're offering them? In, if you if you understand my question, yeah, because there's so many things that you could do. Uh, when you're going to them, are you saying, okay, we're, we're targeting you for this? Or are you saying, look, there's all these problems that exist underneath the deck uh, and, and we'll solve them all for you. And here are the metrics that we can improve certain, you know, KPIs by. Yeah, definitely being a maritime startup is, is, is difficult, uh, because innovation in the sector, it's, it's changing though right now. Um, but, um, if you go back 10 years, there was no innovation in the maritime sector and also the ship owners. We're not keen on learning more about their vessel. They were just, if the vessel is going from A to B, it's fine for us. And a lot of ship owners still think that way. Uh, we're trying to save, uh, change that. Um, and to answer your question is how we how we go to do ship owners. We were fortunate to get accepted in a lot of different kind of uh, accelerators, maritime accelerators, like for example, a Techstar accelerator. Um, and these put us in contact with ship owners that were uh, keen on learning innovation about the sector and were happy to improve things. Uh, and how we go from there is when we have the initial contact is, is it's starting always starting off with me asking a question to them is what's your main pain point at the moment on your vessel? And um, all, all owners have different answers for that. Uh, for example, with sea trade, it was really, they, they lost someone at sea and they said, we really want to solve this issue of having more safety for a crew, uh, because it's, it, it all also results in mental health for the crew and better efficiency because they know they are safe while they are working. Um, so then we focus with them, we focus on that use case. And then for example, with Eastern Pacific shipping, uh, the company that we got in contact with through tech stars, they were really keen on knowing more about uh, everything around and in the engine room. Um, why why are we uh, burning more fuel in these parts of the sea? Uh, why is our cylinder burning up um, randomly? Um, because what, what we learned from the sector is that almost 77% of the failures on board are random and cannot be predicted. So that's, that's a huge number. Uh, so obviously they want to know more and there are so many companies working with AI and everything. If, if we can help them feed more data into the AI, uh, we, we've already seen numbers up to 15% fuel saving and, and in the current, uh, yeah, setting that we are living, saving fuel and saving the planet is becoming so important, even in the maritime industry. 100%. When it comes to those particular customers and possibly future customers as well, how is it that you price solution? How, what is your business model? Yeah. So we, we started off Matt, uh, with being a subscription model because it's very important in these times of, of having a startup to, to create something that, that, that generates recurring revenue, recurring revenue is like. Uh, music to the ears of investors. 
uh, because they know if you have one client, you can survive actually indefinitely uh, because they, they will keep on paying you uh, unless they stop being your client, of course. But uh, apart from that, you have a constant income stream. And uh, that's really important in, in the current uh, days. Um, so that's, that's also how we looked at it. So we start looking into different kinds, different sectors and how, how are they pricing their technology? For example, Wi-Fi providers or mobile data providers. So we work with different packages. We have our base price for the, um, connectivity. So that's the installment of the gateways and the central module, uh, which, um, is done by the crew themselves. So that's also very important for us that we don't need to send technicians all around the world. We made it plug and play, but with connectivity alone, you cannot do anything. Um, so that's really difficult to put a price on that. So then we build up the price saying, for example, you, you pay this price for the connectivity. And now we add a small extra fee for the, uh, engine room monitoring. And then if you want to upgrade to have the crew safety as well, then there is an extra fee for there for that and, and, and so on. So it's actually a modular price. So it's not fixed. Uh, it's a base price for the, for the wireless connectivity. Uh, and I think the possibilities are endless and that's also why we try to do it that way. Uh, we might shift in the future, uh, when we have a lot more use cases to be couple uh, linked to our um our system that we may may shift to um certain data packages so that for example if you if you transfer one gigabyte a day then it's that price and and but right now we don't have that many use cases um so we do it use case per use case understood we've talked about pricing I'm wondering about those customers who are paying for this service. What are your typical, um, the perfect sort of customer? What does that customer look like? Your, your ideal purchasing, yeah. your ideal customer. Yeah. Or ideal customer. That's, that's a great question. And it's very difficult to answer as well, because you have a uh, different kind of ship owners. You have ship owners that buy vessels and now rent it out, uh, to, to say it in easy words. And then you have another, the ship operator that puts cargo and crew on the vessel, uh, or our deal customer actually, in, in my opinion, is a customer that owns the vessels and also operates the vessels. Like for example, um, sea trade, they put, they have their own vessels. They put the crew on the vessels and they move cargo for another company. Uh, but, but the vessel is theirs. So they make the decision on the on the technology that being implemented on the vessel. So that's our ideal customer because we don't need to talk to three different kinds of companies before we can move into negotiations. Um, so, so that that's our ideal customer. And that's also, I think why C trade is one of our first early adopters right now. Navies, uh, have similar problems. I'm sure. How are they currently solving these kinds of problems? Yeah. So. Of course, with, when, when the Navy builds a vessel, um, they already think of these kind of things because, uh, they always want to be better than another country, uh, while, um, ship, ship owners don't really think that far, uh, they, they, they want a vessel that can carry as much cargo as possible in a most efficient way. Um, the difficult part with, uh, Navy vessels is that you have different levels of, um, security. You have data that is, is not that secure. So that, that goes over cable A and then you have uh, like the weapon systems go over cable B and, and so on. Um, but what we really try to focus on is bringing the extra data because when a vessel is being built, uh, it, it has a lifespan of over 40 years. So you, as you can imagine. Um, some of the, of the fleet of, of any Navy, uh, you have vessels that are older than 20 years and the, the sensors coupled to those cables are also older than 20 years. And what we try to do with our technology is that you can 
uh, change these sensors and and add sensors. And if you see that the sensor is is not working anymore, you can just remove it without any hassle or cost or without to the need to take the vessel out of the water because a vessel is always working. There there are no vessels that anchor uh, because they are out of out of job. Oh, they are, but they are very few. A vessel is operating twenty four seven. And if, if you need to take a vessel out of the water for six weeks, that's a very costly operation also for the Navy. And um, we, we, we've actually received some interest from different kind of navies. Um, or, uh, for example, uh, as you can imagine, in the, in the submarine space, there are a lot of connectivity issues. Um, in, in, yeah, actually, the, 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 the issue that we are solving is, is, is in all, all kind of steel environments, because now we are focusing on the maritime industry, but our tech is definitely not limited to that. We can ex we we are actually all already exploring um, implementing in steel factories, for example, uh, or chemical plants where um, where it's difficult to to create a five G network because of the radiation and and explosions and everything. And our network is very more robust and easygoing. Uh, That's fascinating. So so there's, there's, there's massive scope there. And actually, I just want to touch on upon something you were talking about there with respect to security. We see an increase in, in cyber attacks globally on key pieces of infrastructure. And I think we can all agree that shipping lines are, are a key part of the functioning of countries and, um, and societies. So they are an opportunity for, you know, malicious actors to attack as well. How, how have you built in security into your IOT devices? Yeah, so I think an important part there is that the, the connectivity that we provide is locally. Uh, so we focus on bringing the data from point A on the vessel to the bridge or to the control room. So uh, connecting the vessel and then from the point where we export the data out of the vessel, um, we use a VPN WireGuard, something uh, um, maybe the Cyrus security expert will know. Um, that's how we try to um, handle that that difficulty around cybersecurity. Of course, you can never be sure um, that you work you you won't get hacked. Um, but I think an important thing about our technology is that we are data providers, uh, and uh, what we try to do is bring that data to data collectors, like uh, like like the I, uh, AI companies that I mentioned. So what we do is export data and do not import data. So if if the unfortunate event that a hacker would be able to hack our, our system, he will only be able to read and won't be able to uh, take over the vessel or anything. Uh, that's something that we really want to make sure that we are read-only um, and, and also the the connectivity from ship to shore that's something for the Elon Musks in the world and and also for the the cybersecurity part of it is also for them uh, we really just want to to gather the data and make the ship the the smart vessel smart but it stays locally because I being a maritime officer myself I know the importance of the captain making informed decisions. Uh, before going into the Suez Canal, for example, and before having a blackout on the vessel without him knowing and then being stuck in that canal for weeks, interrupting the whole supply chain in the world. Something that we think preventing is a big word, but definitely could have um, given more insights and maybe the captain wouldn't, wouldn't have sailed into the Suez Canal knowing that he would possibly um experience a blackout um so so yeah these are the things that i find the most important and i, I want to um have that uh, knowledge for the captain and that's really my focus and uh, we got a lot of interest for from these other companies but that's really their their business case our our focus is bringing the data to the captain clearly you're onto something pretty big with solution and You've got customers now and you've got a lot of in interest from the industry and different industries as well, in fact. But you've also gotten quite a lot of interest from investors. And you recently 
announced uh, the the raising of a significant amount of investment. I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about that experience and actually also maybe some advice that you would have for other founders who are looking to raise investment at this particular time when credit isn't as easy or investment isn't as easy to come by as it as it used to be. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, I think it's, um, where, where do I start? Uh, when we first start realizing that we needed more money, um, because we bootstrapped a solution at first. So that means that well, the founders, uh, made a contribution to the company to, to pay the first bills. And then once we got approved, um, to become the, the fifth Belgian company, uh, to join Techstars, we received a convertible loan of, um, altogether some, some, something around 200 euros, 200 K euros, sorry. Um, and that got us through the, f through the first months, but I think we received that money in December, 2021. Yeah. 21. Uh, and we realized that this money could only bring us, um, a couple months, um, because we, we were developing hardware and because we, we don't have our own factories or re research plans. That's a, that was our biggest costs. And, um, I was very lucky to have one of my best friends, as I mentioned, Ruben with a lot of financial experience. Um, through Techstars network, we got in conversation with a lot of investors. Um, but unfortunately they were all looking for the bigger investment investments, like over 2 million with ticket sizes. Um, and that was something that we couldn't do because we obviously were still pre-revenue. We are very high risk investments. So we started looking more into smart capital, uh, and that's how we ended up with, uh, with miles ahead, um, and if an, an venture studio from Ghent, actually very new, we were one of their first investments and the conversation started in May, 2022 with them, uh, very good, very interesting conversations. Um, the people from, from the studio are so helpful and started helping us and they all have, they all have very, very much, very uh, are very experienced in, in the entrepreneurship world. They all had their own ventures and everything. Uh, so they start helping us, but we were like, oh, we really need the money right now. And, and it, it started getting difficult. And, um, and then we were in August and we, we decided to stop paying the bills, um, and start emailing all our, um, all, all the companies that we work with, um, saying we have found an investor but we're still struggling and in, in, in signing the deal. It, it will take some time, but we made them sure that the money was coming. Um, we also talked with the team and, um, uh, we actually said we will now stop paying your wages, uh, for a couple months just until, uh, we receive the money. Uh, and, uh, I, I want to, to use this opportunity as well to thank them for their flexibility. Because of course we only started paying uh, wages uh, after the investment of Techstars, so that means that we worked for free for a whole year, um, and then afterwards in August, so only a couple of months after they received some wages, uh, we already stopped paying the wages, um, and then we start moving into term sheets and legal negotiations and due diligence. All these kind of things were so new for me because, um, the only economics class I had at school was, um, what's ma macro economy and what's micro economy, that what's the difference. And that was as far as it went. Um, fortunately we had Ruben who was experienced in these kind of deals sitting normally on the other side of the table. And then finally, uh, in January, we closed around, uh, for, uh, in total 1.3 million. Uh, so we, we immediately emailed all our, um, um, partners saying we paid all the bills. It, it, it took a whole day for me to pay all the bills, uh, start uh, paying all the wages. Um, and, um, I'm very happy that we made it through and now we are a healthy company. Uh, we, uh, we are going to use that money to transition from actually the development to a production company that sells the technology 
and and hopefully will change the industry. And um, the I think the 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 best advice that I can give any founder um, looking for for money right now is um, it will take time, and don't be scared that it it, it will take time. But um, in in the end, um, if you find the the great in, the great investors, um, they they will help you go through with it because our investors were there for us, even though they weren't investors at the moment, but they were committed and helping us navigate through, uh, talking with our partners on how we didn't did not yet pay some bills and and all these kind of things. Uh, I think it's really important um, to for your first round. So this was our seed round. It's very important to look for smart capital and not the big venture capitalists, uh, the big funds, um, because you you really need definitely if you are a young young entrepreneur like myself, you really need the advice from some some people with gray hair. Uh, and and if they are listening right now, uh, it's it's a figure of speech. <laughs> uh, or no hair. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's important that you, you get that advice and you take that advice. And if, if it takes, it takes long that that's something. And, um, but, but you will get there. If you, if you find the right investors, that's the first step. And then everything legal will fall into place. Don't be scared of the due diligence. That was something that kept me up at night because what will they find and everything, but. If, if, if you're a young entrepreneur, you, you make mistakes and they know that you make mistakes. And that's also why it's important to find smart capital, because they know that you will make mistakes and you have made mistakes. And that's also what being an entrepreneur is all about, making mistakes and learning from, from that. And I think in the, in the last two years, I learned so much about being an entrepreneur, raising, I, like, like, for example, I can get advice right now, but Three years ago, I was uh, I, c I could only give you advice on how how to navigate some seas, and I wasn't even that good at it. So um, it, it's it's a learning curve, and also remember that um, you think that if if the if the round is closed, you can sleep uh, very very easily, but when the round is closed, you need to already start thinking about the next round, and um, you you really start to start conversations, building trust with investors, even though it's not the moment right now, give them updates, um, go into calls, uh, even if it's 15 minutes, just update them, build a relationship. And then when the time is right to start raising again, they are there and they know your company already. So you need, don't need to start from zero. They already know you, they know what you're doing and, and, and the trust is already there. I think that's, that's one of the, of the main things, uh, that I can. I can share with the people listening. That's some fantastic advice. And yeah, it really goes to show how grit is such an important characteristic of successful founders moving through those hard times as you have done and then seeing it through to the other side and get to where you are now. You were saying that you've picked up so many um, pieces or learning, learning experiences from your time of being a founder so far. There's a lot of founders, fellow founders who watch this show as well. What would be your kind of key pieces of advice that uh, you would give to early stage founders who are maybe at the sort of same stage as, as yourself? Uh, what, what advice would you give them? The, the advice that I give people that want to start something is, is, is just go for it and don't look back. If jump, it's, it's now that you, you, you can take risks, um, and and if you don't take risk, you 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 won't get there. And and it's the risk taking that that's that's being an entrepreneur is all about. It, it's 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 having stress. It's it's normal to have stress. It's normal to lay lay awake at night thinking about uh, how how will you pay the next bill or um, where will I find um, new new talents and will they join this young team um, with such. Um, so many uncertainties and and the thing is you, you just need to go for it and and uh an important thing is that i uh something that i learned is trust building trust with not only your investors but also with your team i think the most important thing is um because obviously if you're a first-time entrepreneur being a c suddenly you're you are a ceo 
And that's such a big name, being a CEO with such uh, so many responsibilities. I think it's important to not be a, do not be a CEO. You can put it on your LinkedIn, but don't be a CEO. Just build trust with your other team members and give them the freedom to go for the company. Um, because the reason that they joined your company is because they have the same beliefs as you. They, they want to make this a success. You, so you need to give them that trust and you need to let them let go that and know that they will do everything in their power to, to create a company with you. Uh, definitely if you're a small team sitting all together in the same office, um, or, or working from home remotely, you need to trust them and you need to make sure that you can count on them. Um, and, and I think that's, that's one of the most important things. And, and if, and there will be struggles, uh, there will be, um, there will be uh, discussions within the team. And I think it's important to, to move that conversation and make it an open conversation and, and listen to them, uh, and build a team and, and also let them know that if they cannot handle all the stress and, and everything, that's okay. If, if, if they want to shift somewhere else but if they're in love with the company they will stay and they will go for it and they will make the best of it and and i i noticed that uh we just hired someone who is uh, 55 years old he had uh, worked 29 years with uh with a really big ship owner hapa floyd steady income company car fuel card uh social security everything he left that to join our company um and and that shows that um, you can inspire people to join your company, and that's even better if 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 they are motivated, they they will they will go for it, and 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 that's all about trust, trust with your investors, trust trust with your clients, and op- building an open relationship, and then I think then you can go home at night and and just sleep without stress because you know that everybody knows what you know. Where do you go for support, for uh, mentorship, or for guidance as a as a founder of a company? Um, uh, where did I go? Uh, you have something called in Belgium. It's a, it's it's a community. It's called Rubicon. Uh, I joined that last year, and it's actually um, a, a community of all founders from all different kind of ages, and it's 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 really not about advice. It's more about listening to each other and um trying to help understand your problems and and for me that that really helps me um yeah having having my mind at ease uh also having one of my best friends as a co-founder so he's the, he's the cfo but uh i think the people of our team see, our, see us as two the two ceos one who is focusing focusing on the operational side and the other one on the financial side and so I don't think we make any decision without talking through with each other. Uh, we sit right next to each other at 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 the, at the um, in the office. Um, we uh, we almost see each other twenty four seven. So that that's something that 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 I'm really thankful for. Um, and I I also think I couldn't have done it without without him. Being being a, a founder alone can like you said it can be lonely sometimes. Definitely, because you see all your friends um, st- uh, ending their study, going to a big company, having colleagues, um, reporting to their boss, going to work at nine, finishing at five. Um, those are things that I don't have. I My work isn't finished at five. Um, my work isn't finished when I go home. I know that. Um, but it also gives you a lot of freedom. So if, if I want to go play tennis, right after this this podcast i can but i know that i need to work an hour extra this evening or more maybe even two um so i my main advice there is 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 join some communities um but don't don't let don't let them ask a lot of money for it because there are a lot of sharks there uh, that claim that they have a lot of experience and actually don't have that experience uh, so really seek for uh, seek for people that are um, f- yeah in the same phase as you or sometimes after a phase after or before and just join the conversation uh, and one other thing is um, don't do it alone um, find a co-founder find someone that that 
that wants to risk it all and jump with you. And, and then you have always someone to talk about who will understand what you're feeling and what you're struggling with. Um, and I think it's important that your co-founder has a totally different background as yourself. Um, so you can help each other with the advice and you don't have the same opinion about everything. We have a lot of same opinions, but we have our own strengths and weaknesses. And I think that that's the most important part of being a founder is that you don't do it alone. Uh, you can start it alone like myself. Nobody in my team has marit maritime experience except our new hire, uh, Peter. But nobody has maritime experience. But that doesn't matter because Ruben has a lot of financial experience and he doesn't. I think he knows more about the maritime sector now than, than some people that are in the maritime sector. Yeah. So I think that find a co-founder that you can trust and you can build a, a relationship with and, and, and do it together. And then you, then you will, you will succeed. And if you not succeed, you will find something else because one of the import, most important things, as I mentioned earlier, is learning from your failures. Uh, the, the important, important example is the, the light bulb, uh, Edison, uh, tried it uh, over a hundred times and in the 101 time he, he found how we, how we have light in our homes and we still use light bulbs. So I think that's really important to, to know that if you fail, you tried and you learned so much and nobody can take that away from you. And, and, and I think that's the most important part and you will find something new, something new in your life and, and you will move, move from there. And, and when, when I realized that it really gave me some, some peace at mind that if solution fails tomorrow, which, which I hope it doesn't. Um, but I'm, I'm not anxious about what's, what's coming next. I know that I've learned so much and with the knowledge that I have right now, I can, the world is, 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 uh, at my feet. Are you looking to grow out the team? Uh, for anybody who's maybe listening to this and they're inspired by your mission and your enthusiasm, uh, is there, is there any room, uh, left in the, for the, for additional crew? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we have a really big office. In my opinion, it's not, not so big actually, but there are a lot of empty seats still, and I, I would love to see them filled. Um, we are always looking for great developers, um, in the, in the software development world as well, front end, as well as backend as cloud engineering. Um, they're always welcome to, to contact me as well as any, anyone who is interested in, in the entrepreneurial world or the maritime world who is studying right now and wants to do an internship or wants to um, w walk with me for a day or something. Uh, I'm always open for that uh, because I think that's the most important part about being an entrepreneur is, is the, the opportunity to being able to inspire other people to doing something them, themselves. Um, so if you're studying right now and you don't know what to do next, um, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn and uh, I'm always happy to do a short call or, or, or you can come to the office for a day or a week. I'm always happy to, I'm always open for that. Amazing. Sebastian, thank you so much for coming on the show. I love what you're doing with Solution. You're disrupting an industry which has been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and you're doing something completely new in the space. I can't wait to see what you do next. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to to tell my story for the first time. Uh, yeah, I'm very happy. My pleasure. Thank you.